I'm uh, also a millennial, just on the tail end, depending on how you, uh, how you judge it. And I'm really pleased uh, for this great turnout. I, I've been to a few city conversations, and this seems to me like an awesome, I think we packed the room, uh, to talk about millennial exit uh, and what that's going to look like for the city, if it's happening, if it's connected to it. Uh, before we get started, I really quickly want to go through some housekeeping, uh, if, uh, housekeeping tasks. First off, I want to recognize SFU Public Square uh, for sponsoring us and the Center for Dialogue and the SFU City Program. Uh, they make this space possible to, to, to convene everybody here. I'd also like to acknowledge that this is taking place, this event is taking place on unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. Uh, which includes the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil Now, despite, for some of you, this is going to be uh, this is going to be a repetition, but uh, bear with me. Despite um, the lecture hall format, this really is intended to be a real dialogue and a conversation. So, with that in mind, uh, where each of the speakers is going to speak for seven minutes, sharp. We have timekeeper over a timekeeper over here. She will be waving increasingly worryingly if you're going over seven minutes. And we'll go through each speaker, and the, the aim of the speakers are to set the uh, set the frame up the conversation, and then we're opening it up for to everybody here to have that conversation. Um, and the conversation we're going to have is around the idea of money likes it. And and just bear with me, but I'm going to go through the description so everybody knows that they're in the right place. If you're in the wrong place, you'll probably quickly realize it and get up and walk out, and then I'll be a little embarrassed. Um, Young people have always been a critical demographic for robust, vibrant, and diverse cities. The fuel, they fuel the local economy as they enter the workforce and play key roles in infusing the cultural and social fabric of the city with energy. As they grow older, they found innovative enterprises and their children revitalize our neighborhoods and populate our schools. But as Vancouver grows increasingly unaffordable, many worry that millennials are set to leave the city. What can be done to increase livability and retain our youth? And what will happen if we don't take action to do this? These are the questions that will be addressed today during a discussion with Van City VP, Community Investment, Julian Azarov, award-winning writer and columnist, Jessica Barrett, and Vancouver City Councillor, Andrew Reimer. So without further ado, um, I think we will get Start it. Uh, William, we're going to give you the, allow you to kick it off uh, for seven minutes and please uh, help us bring the conversation. Awesome, thank you. I'm going to stand because I think better when I stand. Um, so, thanks so much for uh, having me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this dialogue. My intention, let's see if I keep to it, is to keep this short because I really want to hear the questions and dialogue we'll get into later. So, I'm William Azaroff, I'm Vice President of Community Investment at Van City, and I'm on the board of Mono Cooperative, a car sharing co op. We've got four staff members from over here, so yay. Um, and so why, so I, I've been in the media a bit lately talking about millennials, affordability, housing, rentals, and, and it's been a bit surprising to me, to be totally honest, because every now and then I'm asked to speak to a certain topic, and this one took off more than I ever would have guessed. And so that says that we've touched a nerve, which is part of what we want to do. And maybe what I'll just say is, you know, why does Van City care about this? You know, we've got goals around economic inclusion and social justice, environmental sustainability, and a cooperative economy. And when we look at certain key demographics that are critical to the kind of future society we want to build, that can include new immigrants and refugees, can include the indigenous, the indigenous population in our, in our communities. And it, and it definitely includes millennials. And millennials as a group is painted with a broad brush just because people are born within a certain year and another year, and not everyone even agrees on what those years are. And I bet some people wouldn't even consider you a millennial. I'm certainly not. Um, and so, so when we look at these broad brush issues and how affordability and the housing, the surreal economy that we're in affects millennials, a group of people, like Kurt said, that we need to stay here and start companies and work at places and be a part of our community and run not-for-profits and social enterprises and all these things that we need uh, the next generation to do, uh, if they can't do that, if this isn't an attractive choice of a city for them because of those basic affordability issues, that becomes a big concern for our economy, which is why 
Van City got uh, involved in some of these studies to provoke dialogue just like this. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. I really look forward to hearing where the conversation goes and, and hear what's on people's minds. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and, and, and I set the space for being short. <laughs> Jessica. Uh, um, so I am a millennial, and I am also a colonist. And I guess I got, I ended up becoming sort of a um, unwilling spokesperson for this generation because I wrote a big rant about a year and something ago, threatening to leave Vancouver. And the response was so overwhelming that I decided maybe I would be better off staying and writing about it. <laughs> because it seems to me what's missing from this conversation is um, we get a lot. We've been really stuck in parsing the numbers, you know, how many millennials are there? How much does it actually cost to buy a, buy a home? Um, how can we offset these things? And what we don't have a conversation about is um, the emotional toll of it. I think this is an incredibly heated conversation. And for younger people who are underrepresented in the official conversation that's happening at you know city hall level, in the media particularly, um, we're not talking about all the ways that affordability squeezes us more just than financially, um, you know, from a, an emotional standpoint, a relational standpoint, um, a psychological standpoint, and so that's where I sort of found my niche. And you know, on, on one hand, I've done a lot of research on different generations and where they they're you know in the workforce and also in this housing debate, and I I don't buy into the the, the idea that there are huge differences between generations, but there is a different reality um, between generations in Vancouver right now. And I think certainly one has, seems like it has more to lose than the other. Um, you know, as, as, as the city is changing and we're being asked to change and become a more, a more densely populated city and change the way that we live, we're being compared to cities like Hong Kong and Paris and New York, the difference being that those cities have, you know, a multi-generational history of living in community and they have structures to support that and living in smaller units and we don't. Um, we're having young families that are living right next door to the single family dream who are cramped and don't have space um, and are finding themselves increasingly being told to leave, which is a pretty you know, insulting place to be. I think when you come here and invested in education, um, your, your money, your heart, and your soul in building the community. So I think what is missing in this is the commonality, the linking between um, what the fear is between you know the older people who tend to fight for the preservation of our communities the way they've always been, the single family homes, and younger people who are needing change. Um, and I think that is that there's a fear around loss of community all around. Um, you know, I think that people who've, who've grown up in traditional neighborhoods, they want it to stay the same because that is home to them, that is community. And younger people who feel forced out feel like they're being asked to give up community that they've worked very hard to build and would very much like to sustain and maintain. And that is what we lose when people are forced to leave the city. And people are, are leaving. You know, you can parse the numbers in many different ways. Uh, there are more millennials in Canada than any other generation right now. And we are a hub for education and also immigration. And so we will always have large numbers of young people. But where we are leaving them is, is or where we are losing them is at life stage. The stage at which they're having children. The stage at which those children are being enrolled in school. The stage at which those people are going to put down roots for the next 20, 30 years. Which is a really important place of, in life. And it's where you stand to lose all of that investment and all of that potential that young people and young families bring to the community. Um, and you can see that playing out right now in terms of dropping enrollment in the schools in Vancouver. So there's just not a lot of young children. And if there's not a lot of, you know, it's like a cliche, children are the future. So I think the question is, who wants to live in a city that isn't hospitable to younger people and younger families and growth and community? I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last but not least is uh, Councilor Andrew Reimer. She has a vanity PowerPoint. And um, I should have mentioned it, uh, but I didn't. Uh, if you are interested in tweeting uh, or spreading the word about millennial exit, uh, you can do so at CityCon or using this hashtag. So please uh, you know, get out there on the old internet. <laughs>
Uh, so I did bring a um, PowerPoint. Uh, it doesn't involve a single graph, so no need to be afraid of it. Um, for reasons that will become clear, um, this talk was sort of terrifying me, and I felt it might um, help me focus more if I had some pictures to work with. Um, and really, as I was pulling them together, I realized that the theme of this is really two truths and a dare. Um, so the two truths. Uh, see, so yeah, that's fun. First, so uh, when I was about three years old, that actually made its appearance in the world. This concept of the wave, where people in sports museum or sports museums arenas uh, did the wave. Uh, when I was growing up, this was the most technologically advanced toy I came across as a young child. I coveted one like you would not believe. I never got one, so uh, my birthday's in December. <laughs> uh, the first time I slow danced with a guy when I was about 10, this was the song, brand new song that was playing. We were on roller skates, it was awesome. Uh, first video game, first game that I played where you used a little thing uh, was not Pokemon Go, but um, Galaga. Still pretty good at it if you ever challenge it. Um, this was the first band I saw, Black Flag, that's Henry Rollins. It had a large impact on my lifestyle and clothing choices at the time. Uh, so the first truth is that um, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm not a millennial, so that's the first thing that was terrifying me about creating this talk. Uh, the second truth, uh, this was a popular movie when I was, I don't know, probably mid-teens, let's say, late teens. Uh, so these kids uh, grew up in the suburbs, uh, and they were dying to get out of the suburbs. The only thing on their mind, um, as people who are about to move into that 21 to 35 category, which is sort of a broad definition of millennial now, um, so this generation was doing the opposite exit. They were trying to figure out how to get from the suburbs to the city, because suburbs... Justin Trudeau? <laughs> <laughs> he has his shirt on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, for those kids, um, they lived in the suburbs because their grandparents were dying to get out of cities and get in suburbs, right? So this generation, um, their millennial exit moment, their 21 to 35 childbearing year exit, uh, was from cities to the suburbs. Uh, their grandparents would have been dying to leave, uh, in this case, England, to come to the prairies because that's where land was, right? We had very crowded, very polluted cities. Uh, here in the country, all available land was probably taken up already by other farmers, and the only place you had to go if you wanted to spread out and raise your kids, sound familiar, um, was, uh, in this case, the New World, right? The colonization of the Americas. Uh, that was preceded by an earlier generation that had reasons, you'll know the small kids. Uh, the, I did some research last night. Um, both of these generations were 21 to 35 when they decided to make their exit from wherever they were to come over. That was a very standard practice. And interestingly, at the turn of the last millennium, um, these folks, the Crusaders, were just starting their rise. Uh, and literally hundreds of thousands of people signed up for the Crusades over the course of several hundred years. Uh, and one of the main drivers for it was that they would find no satisfaction in this lifetime in a feudal system. They would never have access to land. They would always be slaves to somebody. Uh, so they wanted to go off to the Crusades. That was their exit. Because when they died, maybe they would find some space in heaven. That was their motivation. <laughs> and our pop culture even suggests that throughout the course of human history, going back to cro uh, Neanderthal times, uh, we were, in fact, moving around um, and exiting. And we, we sort of immortalize this in our pop culture, right? This idea of when you get to a certain age, you leave and go somewhere. So that would be the second truth, which I know is a bit controversial, because it's hard to think of yourself as not special, not having gone through something for the first time. Um, but to say that millennial exit um, is not that new a phenomenon when you look back on human history, it's a very common phenomenon. Um, which brings me to the dare. Um, what if we were actually the first generation of folks who came together uh, and decided to, this is where the pictures end, because it's about 1.13 in the morning at this time, and I <laughs> ran out of energy for finding pictures for it. But what if we were the first generation, collectively, that came together and figured out how not to exit, right? We fell in love with a place enough that we were willing to take all of this incredible innovation and exploration sort of drive that we have, and instead use it into exploring new ideas about how to keep together as multi-generations in one space. So housing is an obvious answer, but I would say, I mean, 
As you saw, over about 200,000 years, we've been having a debate about housing as a commodity and how to get our hands on affordable housing, right? This is not the cave people there in the movie. I don't know if you saw Climb Up the Cave Bear, but they're looking for a new cave because theirs is not affordable anymore in the context of, uh, of the movie. So the question then isn't so much about how we argue over space, and I think some of that's actually solving itself as we see some more, more and more millennials showing up at public hearings more and more high density and different forms of density being approved, so housing projects, different ways of living together. I was at a micro-housing discussion the other day that looks like it's getting closer than it ever has. I think, picking up on what Jessica said, more importantly is why would you want to have housing in a city, right? Is it going to be friendly to you? Um, we build a lot of childcare as the city of Vancouver, and again, I would argue that's a bit of a tired and boring debate. More interesting to me, would be innovating some ideas about child-friendly space, right? Why aren't there children in this room? Some of you are probably like, ooh, I don't want to sit in a lecture with children, but why wouldn't we welcome in more generations than just the ones that we think have the cognitive capacity to listen to a talk? Um, there's cities now in England where they legislate mandatory child play spaces in every restaurant, no matter how much the dinner costs there, right? You might feel yourself kind of going, oh, I don't know that I want to do that, but why would, if you want to be welcomed in as a millennial, why wouldn't you also want to welcome in their children and the next generation um, as it grows into a city? And the last big provocative idea I would say is around the economy and what we're doing to support millennials in the workforce. In New York City, uh, so consider that over 90% of millennials will have precarious consultancy, contract, some kind of employment that doesn't provide the kind of wages and benefits that keep you in a place. New York City just opened up its municipal pension plan so that anyone can buy into it. So if you don't have a pension plan, you can buy into theirs. Mm -hmm. And what that does is stabilize their pension plan because they have an aging workforce. And it means that you as a worker suddenly think, maybe I'll stay in New York because my pension is here over the long term, right? Uh, Urban Workers Project, trying to get cities to pass bylaws that to get a business license, you have to commit to paying consultants within 30 days of the invoice going out, right? What difference would that make for literally thousands of people in our city who wait a very long time to get paid, and that might be the difference between them being homeless or not if that check doesn't come at the right time. So really thinking instead about how to explore the suburbs or all of Canada or the world, how do we explore the ideas that it's gonna to take to actually live multi-generationally in the way that the millennial exit sort of has been speaking to? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, presenters. Uh, now, I don't know if I'm pulling up the Michael Alexander, but I'd say now it's your turn to, uh, to uh, start the conversation or, or continue the conversation. So I'm wondering if uh, we'll open it up if folks have a uh, thing. And if I, if I haven't seen you, uh, I will do my best. Just wave at me while I'm sitting down and I'll, I'll keep, a, keep a lookout. Sir, with the pink shirt. Hi everyone, my name is Brendan. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I was driving this morning to downtown with my housemates and we were talking about sort of the rings of hell. Uh, the first one being finding a house or somewhere to rent in Vancouver, and then the second one being to find a job. Uh, we're all about, I'm the oldest and I'm 24, and our, we live 23rd at Wallace, and we're the only house on our street that uh, rents. Everyone, everyone else on the street owns, and the owners have decided to, that they're going to knock it down and build a, a mansion at the end of the month. So we're all scrambling and trying to sort that out. Five days, you know, we have the three of you, and I have a question uh, for William. Uh, maybe you can start off and answer and the other two respond. Uh, to what extent is this affordability issue one of supply? And um, what can municipal government or other levels of government do to um, either address that or solve that issue? Yeah, I think, I think supply, I think in, in my senses in other jurisdictions at other times, supply was probably the biggest lever. And at this point, supply is definitely a lever but it's one of several, and that's what makes this such a complicated issue. And even like, I think with some issues, you could point at a level of government or a body. And one of the things we say in a lot of our reports, and, and, and I try to reiterate whenever I can, is that at this point, to dig us out from the bit of a hole we're in, um, we're gonna need multi-levels of government talking to each other, organizations like the Co-op Housing Federation, you know, not-for-profits, non-governmental groups, you know, we're going to need to, re and that's why I love that this conversation is continuing, even though not all those organizations are represented here, we need people from different perspectives who have different levers to pull to come together. 
And then, and this is where, you know, the thing, the, the reason I was happy to speak to this issue is that, uh, so I'm gonna get back to your point in just a second, is that, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't really like it when any group is painted with a brush. And the brush that millennials tend to be painted with, that, that I hear, is that they're whiny. And this bothers me intensely because th this is a generation that's inheriting some very big and serious problems. Problems that have been partly solved, or the can has been kicked, or the wrong solutions have created a spilling out of other problems. And so, um, I don't perceive that this is a whiny generation. I just perceive this generation is going to throw up their sleeves and address some of these issues in a more profound way than, I mean, we're Gen Xers, so the problems have skipped us. Like, we just sort of, I don't know, like, I have a sense of Gen Xers sort of going, oh. Um, <laughs> you never remember Ray <laughs> so, so, um, and so, anyway, uh, and so I think what, uh, what we're seeing is, in the short term, creativity. That's the word that keeps coming to my mind, is people who are finding creative solutions, whether it's microspaces, you know, people sharing mansions amongst, you know, 12 people, um, people moving farther out, people, you know, what, there, we see lots of different things going on, and every time I hear about a new kind of creative solution, I, I add that to my sort of roster of, of solutions. And then we do have to address um, problems of supply, problems of nimbyism, uh, problems of, what, I mean, you summed it up really well, what is the kind of society we want to live in? And, and we need to have empathy for people for whom that society is changing quicker than they'd like it to, and, um, and therefore they're, they're, they're worrying about the loss of community that they've come <coughs> to at the same time We've got to go where address the problems that are with us today. So I don't I don't know if I really answered your question, but it's it's so complex. <coughs> Anyone you want to jump in on, on, on that? I can talk about how to fight for the current <laughs> time. Um, I guess a simple point I would make: um, it is not the only solution, but it must be part of the solution. Um, in the last two months, July June, City Council approved building more rental housing in two months than was approved for the entire three years term of a council before us, right? So, um, and there was a decade that basically nothing got built from 2008 back to 1998. So yeah, there's a serious supply constraint problem. It doesn't mean though that it's either the only solution or always the solution, right? As much as um, you can modify housing, the more problem you're gonna have. Consider that um, there is, exists nationally, a national egg strategy that is aimed at getting you an egg that is healthy and safe and affordable um, every single day of the year, right? So such a thing does not exist for housing in Canada. So consider that, right? Like in one case, there's a lot of eggs available and they're reasonably affordable. In the other, there's not a lot of it available and it's reasonably unaffordable. And it really does come down to looking at um, basic needs and then layering in the commodity on top of that once the needs have been met. And we've been City program. Jessica, when you say Vancouver, do you mean the city, the region, both? Does it matter? Um, I think when I started writing a lot about this topic, I would have meant the city, and now I think now I mean the region because we've seen affordability concerns spill over. When I so it's about a year and a bit ago that this really became kind of like hit the big times, what I would say, um, and it started running really high. And at that point, the refrain was always, well, if you don't like it, move to the suburbs and commute. It's what your parents did, it's what you do. And then a lot of people did that. And now you can't live in the suburbs either. <laughs> so the suburbs you know, are already off limits um, for a lot of people. And so I think I'm, I'm talking about metro at this point. What mechanism would you use to limit the rate of growth? I don't know if it's about limiting the rate of growth necessarily. I think it's about, uh, like Andrew was saying, I think it's about recalibrating our communities to accommodate growth, which means that everybody has to start sharing. What does that mean? Okay, so uh, for instance, like it that. means it means um, it means everybody getting on board to say goodbye to the single family neighborhood. So you're prepared to say to the single family neighborhoods, put yourself in Andrea's shoes here. Too bad. Well I've done a lot of covering of city council and city council processes around zoning and I know a lot of the of the um, pushback that city council gets when they strive to introduce density in different forms of density in, in different neighborhoods. So
So things that we don't see a lot of that could be very useful um, to accommodating particularly young families are three bedroom units, ground oriented housing, townhouses, row houses, and those could really easily go in the 70%, I think, of Vancouver right now, which is single family residential. Let me put it another way. Uh, are you prepared to say that the belief that the neighbors, the residents, the community knows best is wrong? No, but I do think that we hear from one part of the community a lot more than we hear from another part of the community, and both perspectives need to be equally weighted when we think about how we're going to go with the city going forward and accommodate everybody. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna no jump. Dialogue, no dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of dialogue. I'll come back to you. I'll go you over here. Okay, just a couple of comments. To your question, is it a question of supply? I think it's a question of need. I think we've seen um, governments at all levels go for the quick and easy money to build places to sell, not places to create community for people to live with and rent. And that has to change. It will take a lot of time. I know our city's been working to try and convince and the federal government to make some changes in that direction and take it back to the time when we had. Walk with, talk about new ways to shape housing. It looks very exciting, co-housing, different kinds of housing. I am so sorry for you guys. Um, I have kids in the same, in the same boat. Um, so there's that. We, we have to stop our thinking about that and look at what's really important. Also, I live in a single family house, which I've lived in for 30 more years. I know how incredibly privileged I am. Other countries don't have this single family neighborhood. Cities, you don't see this. You see a lot more rentals. So I started out, I live in East Van, I started out seeing the no tower, that was a commercial, and I totally done a lot of my thinking on that because I realized single family, it may take a while to convert it, but it is going to have to change. It's going to have to make room for more laneway houses, more rental spaces, more more density, and um, I'm considering building a laneway house for my kids. <laughs> Maybe I'll move into it. But, but I think change has to happen, but it is, it is going to take time, and we need to hear more about the need for that and our creative ways to do it. Anyway, that's it. Uh, we go Michael. Michael Alexander. Uh, what a shame for Vancouver. Vancouver is a successful city, and we are finally coming to grips with that success. Every successful city in North America has the same problems as Vancouver. If you want to live in an unsuccessful city, you can move to Detroit and you can get the you can get the biggest house you want for the cheapest price that you can that you can find. But you gotta live in Detroit. Right? If you want to live in New York, you've been dealing with this problem for more than decades, for a hundred years. If you want to live in San Francisco, you're looking at $5,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. The big issue for me, and, and to, to the point that 70% of, uh, of Vancouver's land is for, for single-family housing, that's going to take, uh, that's going to be a long, hard process for changing that. People who are there don't want to change, by and large, you hear, you hear those voices very strongly. The people who want in aren't raising their voices enough, which is why I'm really glad that this conversation is taking place. But I think there are two issues here. One is local, and one is national. The local is not amenable to government to change, and that is that there's a huge income disparity uh, between people who live and work in Vancouver and people who live and work in just about any other city in, in, in Canada. Our incomes are remarkably low. Uh, I regularly hear about people who say, oh, I'm moving, uh, I'm moving to, uh, to Toronto because my wife got a job doing exactly what she's doing here, but she's getting $20,000 a year more in, in Toronto. Why is that? I don't know. But it's a reality, it's been consistent. The other thing is, there's not enough rental housing. And that's not something, that is something that this council has struggled with and tried to perform on. But it's not something that a city can really do. We don't, the city simply doesn't have enough tools to do it. We used to have a national uh, uh, policy that uh, provided enough tax breaks to people who built 
purpose-built rental housing that the developer would not sell, but rather would own, and therefore have an incentive to build quality buildings because he knew he was going to have to take care of those buildings for a long time. And that provided a great rental stock in, uh, in, in Canada. That policy is gone. Those, those uh, tax incentives that allow that are history. I would argue that we need to rethink how that's done, but that, that's at the national level. It's definitely not at the local level. The real question I, I ask is, why is <coughs> income so miserably low here? So that's an interesting question for our bank uh, representative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe if you could touch on uh, income inequality or, and or uh, the other uh, issue around rental housing, uh, William, and then I, I have forgotten about the well, and, and actually, can I, so what, Sarah, what's your name? Brendan. Brendan. So, and you talked about, how did you frame what you said? The, the rings of hell. Right? Rings of hell, yeah. And the first one was housing, second and the second job. was job. And we haven't really, so I think there's a pivot between those two things. Like, I think that's, that's part of the problem is that the job market here, I've lived in a few cities, not that many, and the job market here is weird. And there aren't a lot of head offices, like things we all know, right? Well, I don't know, maybe we talk about too much, but we don't talk about enough. But it is, I think, I think there is this income disparity, uh, certainly between the cities that we keep comparing ourselves to in Vancouver. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think there's more to discuss there. I don't, I don't know that I have any brilliant reasons why that is, but it's, it's definitely a problem. Because I think the millennial exit, the whole notion of this talk, if, if we have the housing situation we have, but at least you could find a decent paying job, well then, you'd have more runway, and so it's the confluence of those two things for sure. And sorry, what was the other thing? Rental stock. Well, I, I think Andrea summed that up perfectly. I I I think that uh, we we went ten years. We didn't really build rental housing in the city, and 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 then you take <coughs> rental housing. We do have, uh, and I think about co-op housing, and a lot of it's dilapidated and needs to be refurbished. And not only do you need to build more, but you're at risk of losing some of the supply you have, and that's happening every day, and so it's refurbishment, uh, retention, and uh, new builds. And so we are seeing more than we've ever seen before, and that's a positive sign. It will take years of doing that before we make up for the shortfall. Um, and uh, it, like, I think that's part of the problem, is that people want to need a solution now. They can't find a job. They, they got evicted from a house they've lived in. Um, we hear this all the time, and the, pro the solutions are, you know, it's complex, but they're fairly clear, but they're gonna take, you know, it's gonna take a generation or two for the people who live in these single family houses to, to for some of these attitudes to change, and not everywhere, but for some of these areas just to get more comfortable with infill housing, more density, a few, you know, walk-ups or high-rises or whatever that solution is, so that we make up for this, so that you have options available to you. Can we afford to wait, though? Right. I've seen so, I, before I started writing about this, I wrote a three-year-long project writing about the state of work across Canada. And so Vancouver uh, went from being kind of, you know, a backwoods resource industry town to a creative sector hub. And all across the workforce, we've seen a move towards more precarious contract part-time um, and temporary jobs. But we've seen that primarily in creative industries. And so if you look at what Vancouver is based on, film and television, um, you know, a lot of digital media. It's all, it's been the tradition in those industries for a long time to hire people for a short time and cut them loose, and it's becoming more so. And then if you look, so you see a lot of people who are self-employed. Um, BC is also a leader across the country in terms of small business. And so when you work for a small business, you're either self-employed or you, you know, employ five people maybe. Um, there's a cap to how much you're gonna earn. There's a cap to, to where you can go within those corporations. And so naturally, that's part of the, the impact that is keeping wages lower. Can I just add yeah. one thing? Because I, I would hate to see them get off scot free on this. Um, the biggest single difference in income equality in, I think people mentioned several cities, is the provincial government. Because they're the ones who come up with the um, income, they come up with minimum wage, they come up with income supports, they come up with employment standards. Um, at the time, when everybody else in Canada is increasing all of those things, um, our government has either stayed static or actually gone downhill in the case of employment standards quite substantially. Uh, and that results in less protected, more precarious work. Um, there are historical roots to it. We did, 
historically depend on large companies, logging companies, to write big union contracts with large workforces. Um, so we've always been a little behind the rest of Canada in terms of employment standards, but now we're, we're light years behind the rest of Canada. But to consider that in the context of um, global income inequality has been, any measure you look at in Western democracies, income inequality has been um, quite severely diminished over the last 20 years as a result of our friends, Reagan, Thatcher, and a variety of other folks from, from the 80s. I just one quick comment on, on the jobs that could bring the housing things. Mm -hmm. With regard to jobs, and one thing I don't hear at the level of government really is speaking about broadly is the impact of technology in that the jobs that technology produces or brings in are way fewer than jobs that it replaces. And I think that's one contributing factor to the jobs issue aside from the globalization and the liberal agenda that, that Andrea has mentioned. And I think that impact is huge. And I think people aren't able to talk about it because we really don't know how it's going to evolve or, sh or shape. So that's on the job. With the housing supply following up on Mr. Alexander, I think it was in Andrea's point and your point as well, it's very complex. But until, um, uh, if you just start thinking that you're going to replace single family neighborhoods with built out housing, and all of a sudden affordability will improve, that's delusional. Because the land cost is so high, developers will not build anything but market housing unless other programs are put in to support, to provide incentives to do otherwise. Land is just too expensive. So you're not going to build uh, stuff that is going to be affordable. So yes, supply has to increase, but also the types of supply have to be looked at, and they have to be tied into provincial and national programs Otherwise, you're just going to get smaller, expensive homes <laughs> as opposed to homes that are affordable at different sizes. So, yeah. On the tech side, the data actually shows the opposite direction. It was hypothesized it would put people out of work. It's actually, tech has made us slower, less productive, and needing more people to do the same thing, which is a fascinating um, paradox, and I'm happy to talk about it. Well, but I've heard, there's, there's also, for example, dairy farms. I realize that's not a Vancouver issue, but as an example, dairy farms that would have employed 30, 40 people now employ three to six people because even milk and cows is automated. And where so two people used to be in the distribution chain, now 50 are employed managing all the logistics and technology to get you your milk just in time. So yeah, I mean, certain industries, but on the whole, it has led to more employment, okay. um, but less productive employment. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go over to you. My concern with more Norris is a little bit different um, because it's from the government around education and the students with the background. Um, my son was born in the West End and I'm part of the community for 10 years and pretty quickly, and by the way, there were tons, I, I have a network of friends who mm -hmm. all had children, young children, babies in the West End in the past 20 years. So young families are thriving in Vancouver, however, anecdotally I can say many of them, yes. 
I'd, I'd actually, I, I, I'd be curious if, if would you, are you, is that going to force you to leave? Well, no, I guess. To, to just answer, tie it into the. My short answer would be that is the, now, that is the thing that contributes to my thinking of leaving more than the housing crisis. Like DC, <laughs> because um, it's a provincial. Well, I mean, I don't. Did we happen to know Vancouver has the best uh, support to maybe school system um, in the south, but seriously, way better than Surrey and way more than a small town would have. So if you're fleeing, looking for more service, like you're heading in the wrong direction. Um, Are you confident that will continue based on the, you know, all the everything you're hearing is for us? Well, okay, so I used to be on a school board, it's hard for me to, sorry, I feel like I'm taking up too much air time here, but I feel like I, I yeah, should I maybe jump in on sure. that. Yeah. So I was elected the school board in 2002. At the time, there were 52,000 students in the city of Vancouver. There's now 58,000, and yet suddenly they want to close schools, right? So that this isn't about the number of students in the school system. Mm -hmm. It is about a relentless drive for efficiency um, from the provincial government in the spending in the school system. They've come up with this thing called a capacity formula, which does not include hallways, music rooms, gymnasiums, bathrooms, school offices, cafeterias. So when they say the school's at 95%, they're only talking about the children per classroom because Vancouver has older schools. Our classrooms, our gymnasiums, our, our uh, cafeterias tend to be bigger. So um, where they're going to fit all these kids with 12 less schools, I don't know. But the provincial government's been playing that. You know, they, they have a lot of communication staff and they've been playing a good media game on it. The school age population in Vancouver has not declined in many decades. It continues to rise at the rate of population. The only census for what that, which that wasn't true was the last one, which <laughs> any expert would tell you was not actually a census. So yes, more affluent people apparently don't have children because our income also rose 24% in the last census across the city. So we know some data was wrong in that census and I suspect the child age population was as well. So yeah, fight, fight for the school, get the information and fight for the schools because it is criminal what they've been doing to the education system. Is this related it's to you? This is totally related, yeah. I'm just Curious, maybe you have a perspective on this. Has per capita student funding increased, or has it decreased? It has. It has increased at a sheer dollar ratio. Buying capacity, not even close to um, the cost. So the provincial government legislates all the costs and then provides a fraction of that um, per student to cover. So the school board's left with a pretty substantial amount of, of delta. It has to cut because it has no way of raising its own funding. We have the lowest per capita. Yeah, just a, a couple of points. I just got evicted in the uh, middle of April. I probably know about 100 people in the last five years that have been uh, evicted. I think one of the troubling things, given uh, the state of the real estate market, the housing market in particular, I could also part of call it a corrupt market because it was self-regulating uh, itself in a, in a way that was totally uh, inadequate. The duration of how far this has gone on is totally problematic, and, and largely at the provincial level, the tenancy uh, legislation that not a mature policy framework in the same way that it would be in Ontario or Quebec. And so because the legislation is in a state of regulatory capture, the ability to uh, amp up the system on the side of uh, development and keeping this market uh, going is, is one of the challenges. And I would say uh, people uh, also, if they can't live in an urban center, they're not necessarily going to choose to go live in the suburbs. They would rather go to Toronto or Berlin. And so we're seeing an exodus of artists out people have mentioned, certainly friends of mine with children in particular, are choosing to go uh, elsewhere. I think, I think that people here are far too polite in Vancouver in a general sense because this has gone, we've had the UN Special Rapporteur on Housing here, we've had many, many, a city as unaffordable as this one shouldn't be having an Olympics. You know, there's a 
whole series of things that have gone on. So I'm not optimistic in the short or even medium term until people rise up and, and go after the, the, the governments. And certainly provincial and federal governments have uh, been the ones that have uh, cut back. But I think there's actually far more the city can be doing, advocating in a much more aggressive way, given the, the real crisis that's happening where people are living uh, on the margins and getting uh, pushed out. I'm going to go over to you. Do you feel that uh, we're being too polite about the crisis? Is it a crisis? <laughs> um, I think we're usually too polite in Canada about this, specifically the younger generations. I mean, it kind of goes back to uh, the point of raising the voices of those who want in on these communities. And thank you for the name drop for the Urban Workers Project, Andrea. I was part of that. Um, precarious work being um, one of the largest issues I think our generation faces. But I think we are too polite about it. And I think that, I mean, I look at myself. So I'm a cisgender white male who's gone through two post-secondary degrees. I'm incredibly privileged to be in the position that I am, and I'm fighting to get in, or to stay in, really, in the community. So to be honest, my patience for single detached homeowners is spent. Um, <laughs> my desire to wait 10 years for Candy Street to get redeveloped into row housing is spent. So I think it comes down to me about raising the voices of those being affected, and unfortunately, my generation doesn't vote. So we don't really impact who sits in Victoria, but we don't really get policy geared towards us. So I think we are being too polite, and I think we've historically been too polite, and I think that's our issue. And I think that the combination of the most educated generation in history that's strapped with the highest debt, that being student debt of any generation in history, is the piece that makes us a little bit special to sort of read off of the historical reading of previous generations, and that combined with facing a very difficult economy makes for, I think, a lot of disaffected people. So if I can sit here with all the privilege that I have and talk about that privilege and about the issues we're facing, I only imagine what those with much less privilege are facing. So I think we are being too polite, um, and I think we need to take some, some hard looks. And at this point, my attitude is just do something. So I actually had a question, and that is around that doing something. So we have a provincial election in the spring. If the, one of the three of you were running to be the premier of this province, <laughs> what is one thing that you would change immediately? Because I'm kind of tired of the complicated answer. I kind of want one thing. And if somebody says yours, yeah, if somebody says yours, think of another. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Who wants to go first? I, I will. I would form the Residential Tenancy Act. I would close the loophole on fixed term <laughs> rent. Um, I would introduce, I would tie rent yeah. control to suites or buildings rather than tenure of occupancy. I would introduce rent stabilization measures that limit how much you can raise rents in certain areas and certain buildings in between tenants. I think that we, the provincial government has to stop looking at, at home ownership as the ideal because there are too many of us, and state, so do renters as the ideal. A lot of us are going to be not stuck or choose, we're gonna be renters forever. And it is baffling to me that renters are not recognized as a large voting block and don't act as a voting block. Why don't we have a renters union in Vancouver that is robust and making our voices heard? It's baffling to me. All right. I'm going next. <laughs> <laughs> that was my <laughs> about renting or owning, it's about security of tenure, right? Whether that's co-op, co-housing, rental, ownership, um, and you should be afforded that, right? Um, even if you don't have a capital client. But let's, if I get a magic, is it a magic wand or a real mm -hmm. Okay, magic wand, I would tie minimum wage to rent increase. So if rent increases by a certain amount in the city, minimum wage goes up by that much. Because I can tell you, the incentive to build rental housing would suddenly get very high and to make um, housing affordable. In a city with so many small businesses, like it would suddenly become the driving um, fixation of everybody in the city. Well, you both have to come up with We should ask that question a lot more. I like how I, I'm sweating a little bit. Um, I, well, I, and so the two things that come to my mind, which only I couldn't think of anything brilliant that got right at this issue. One is around what we just talked about, per capita child funding for education. Uh, that doesn't address this issue, but is uh, a huge worry of mine uh, long term. 
And the other, which doesn't address this issue directly either, but is the fact that shelter rate for those who don't have the privilege that's in this room hasn't gone up in a decade now, maybe more, but I think a decade. Yes. Yeah. It barely went up eight years ago, so right. it's really been about 20 years. Right. That's okay. thank you for that. Yeah, that's right. And so, and even the amount of people on welfare disability can earn. Uh, before they get benefits clawed back. Like, there's a whole spectrum, right? We're talking about one part of the spectrum, which is really important, and and I'm, I'm pleased we're talking about it, but it is, like, that's where, for me, it does become complex very quickly, because as complex as this conversation is, this is one part of the spectrum. And when we walk around the spectrum out to include people who are struggling in ways that, that I think many people in this room have trouble imagining, uh, I really worry about them and, and what, what I'm going through. So those are two things that come to mind. We are coming to, um, I'm sorry, we're coming to uh, a cl close. We have time for one more, and this gentleman got, got out in front. I, I'm hoping uh, you can uh, provide a last, our last word, and then we're going to bring it to a close. I, I don't know if some of you presenters can stay around. Some of them might not be able to, but I'm going to give you the last sort of comment or question, and then we'll close. All right. Um, it ties into the white comment and Gordon's comment about can you tell the neighborhood that they are lawful? And Seattle just did this. Seattle took basically said, our neighborhood assemblies don't represent the city. They don't represent this. That can't go on. So we're going to bring it back and make this more of a professional thing to be able to address this holistically. So they specifically have said, no, city, you're wrong. There are things that are better. So that maybe is an answer that maybe we should do. People do need to be told they're wrong. <laughs> so is that, if they are as a group, that we can, yeah, we can, uh, we can close with that. I don't know if anybody has any additions to people being told they're wrong. Well, I think we need to look at who the neighborhood yeah. is. I mean, I, I, I don't own in my neighborhood, but I've lived in Vancouver for 13 years. I've lived in the same neighborhood for 11 of them. I, my voice deserves to be heard in order to stay in my community. But when we do look at neighborhood associations, for whatever reason, maybe more total income, more time, they are overwhelmingly comprised of older people who own property. And that does need to change. Actually, it really surprises me that so many people here seem, seem to be content to rent all their lives. You know, um, most, <laughs> my generation, you bought the house so that you would have something when you got older. It was a way of having a little bit of equity and, you know, of course, savings. But if you don't invest in your living accommodation and something, where will this um, future of security come from? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's the right way to put it. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I am a freelancer. I have no pension, if that means something other than that. Um, you know, and then I've been thinking about it as I get into my thirties about investing in something, some security, some real estate, which won't be here. But I didn't know that ten years ago when I moved here to go thirteen years ago when I moved here to go to university, that if I didn't like scrimp and save and I don't know, use my student loans to try to buy a condo then, that it wouldn't be possible for me when I was in my thirties and wanted to settle down and own something and invest in something. It changed. And I don't think anybody here just saw that. So I think it's the people who are renting right now, it's the choice is, can I be content to rent or can I go someplace else and buy? And I think more like more than half of Vancouver rent. So who are the minority to tell the majority what they should or shouldn't want, right? Like it, we shouldn't have to justify our desire or our necessity of renting. We should just come up with public policy that supports us. Um, full disclosure, I was again like this two, two months ago, beginning out at the end of the month. Um, from a community I've met, I've moved nine times we just gave up. Like, there's nowhere to rent there. There's been no new rental housing built in 15 years, and we can't, cannot afford. And I make a pretty good salary. You can go online and look it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, to do it. So, I, I mean, I very keenly feel the frustration. I would say, sort of, the last point I would make for folks, because we've been talking about millennial access, um, there is this gigantic baby boomer exit going on. That's actually what's fueling this: is baby boomers cashing out of their house. Um, they can't stay in their community. They fought density, maybe not those specific ones, but they fought new density. They have nowhere to move in their community, so they moved to Pearl Harbor or Kelowna or wherever, 
um, and they want to cash out big chunks of money, and that's what's making, because all the affordable housing, ground-oriented, family development we need actually exists in the city in that 70%. It's just not financially accessible to the people who now <coughs> need to, um, and this is a legacy problem, and I think we avoid that topic too much. This is not a millennial problem, it is a big people problem, and we need them engaged to figure out how to solve it. So I, I, I've got one last, we gotta, we got to wrap up. Um, I'm getting the I'm getting the king from multiple sides, but I, I would ask if there is one last for the presenters. If, if anybody here actually has an optimistic thing to say about this problem, <laughs> if, if we can end on an optimistic note, that would absolutely make my day. Um, does anybody have a, a final thought that's optimistic about what we're looking at? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Big uh, round of applause. Uh, uh, we have some uh, fancy honey from Hives for Humanity uh, as our thank you gift. Thank you very much. Some of them will, our presenters will hopefully stick around. Thank you very much for coming. And we will please make sure you go to our website for future.